Get ready to journey into the dark depths of the Middle Ages, where punishment was nothing short of diabolical. Today we delve into the chilling world of medieval crime and punishment. From gruesome torture chambers with horrific torture devices like the rack and iron chair, to public spectacles of punishment like the pillory. But wait, there's more secrets in each section, leaving you shocked by the barbaric practices of the past. Crimes and Misdemeanors Let's kick things off with everyone's favorite pastime, thievery. In the medieval ages, stealing was no small matter. Whether you were swiping a loaf of bread to feed your hungry belly or snagging jewels from the local lord's treasure chest, getting caught with sticky fingers could lead to some pretty harsh consequences. And trust me, you didn't want to find yourself at the mercy of medieval justice. But theft wasn't the only way to get on the wrong side of the law. Oh no, there were plenty of other ways to land yourself in hot water. Poaching, for example, was a big no-no. If you were caught hunting the king's deer or nabbing fish from the lord's private pond, you could expect a swift and severe punishment. And let's not forget about treason, betraying your king or country was about as serious as it got, and the penalty was often death. But perhaps the most chilling crime of all was heresy. Questioning the authority of the church or speaking out against religious doctrine could earn you a one-way ticket to the stake, where you'd meet a fiery end as punishment for your blasphemous beliefs. Yep, in the Middle Ages, they didn't mess around when it came to matters of faith. Oh, and last but not least, we have witchcraft and sorcery. In an era steeped in superstition and fear of the occults, accusations of witchcraft could spell doom for the accused. Suspected witches, who were most often that, not just marginalized individuals or healers practicing alternative medicine, were subjected to brutal trials and executions, typically by hanging or burning at the stake. The Manorial and King's Court Picture this, you're living in the Middle Ages, where knights roam the land and kings reign supreme. But beneath the glittering surface of castles and chivalry lies a dark world of crime and punishment. In medieval society, crime was rampant and punishments were severe. From theft and poaching to treason and heresy, there was no shortage of offenses that could land you in hot water. And when it came to meeting out justice, medieval authorities didn't mess around. First, let's talk about how justice was served in the medieval courts. The manorial court, for example, dealt with all but the most serious crimes. It was held at various intervals during the year, and all villagers had to attend or pay a fine. Villagers were organized into groups of ten, called a tithing, responsible for ensuring none of their members broke the law. And if a member of a tithing broke a law, then the other members had to make sure that he went to court. The Lord Steward presided over these courts, with a jury of twelve villagers deciding the guilt or innocence of the accused. The jury not only collected evidence, but also decided whether the accused was guilty or not guilty, and if found guilty, what the medieval punishment should be. For more serious crimes, like treason, the accused faced a very interesting and an extremely absurd trial by ordeal in the king's court. Now, what exactly was this trial by ordeal? Well, it included three different ordeals. The first was Ordeal by Fire, where the accused had to pick up a red-hot iron bar and hold it while they walked three or four paces. Their hand was then bandaged, and after three days, they had to return to the court where the bandages were removed. If the wound was beginning to heal, they were innocent, but if the wound showed no sign of healing, then they were pronounced guilty. Up next we have Ordeal by Water. Now this is where the accused had their hands and feet tied together and were thrown into water. If they floated, they were guilty, but if they sank, they were innocent. Talk about a lose-lose situation, what does one do with their innocence once they're dead? I have no idea. Then lastly, we have Ordeal by Combat, where noblemen would fight, usually to the death, in combat with their accusers. The winner of the battle would then be considered to be in the right. But fear not, after 1215, trial by ordeal was replaced by trial by jury, bringing a bit more fairness to the justice system. Torture Chambers and Dungeon Depths Medieval torturers had an entire arsenal of diabolical devices at their disposal, each designed to inflict maximum suffering on the human body. 
One of the most chilling aspects of medieval torture was its routine use as a means of justice. Suspected criminals were subjected to brutal interrogations, their guilt or innocence often determined by their ability to withstand the agony of the torturer's implements. In the eyes of medieval society, confession under torture was seen as irrefutable proof of guilt, regardless of the truth. Let's start off with the thumbscrews. Yes, it's like the name suggests. Thumbscrews were among the most excruciating instruments of medieval torture. This diabolical device consisted of metal screws that were slowly tightened, crushing the victim's thumbs and fingers with agonizing pressure. As the screws bore down, the victim would experience intense pain. Imagine getting your fingers crushed, often resulting in the extraction of confessions under duress. Then we have the infamous rack. The rack, a notorious fixture in medieval dungeons, was a large wooden frame designed to stretch the victim's limbs to unbearable lengths. It was constructed with a roller at both ends, where the criminal had their ankles fastened on one end and their wrists to the other. The torturer then cranked a handle to stretch the victim during interrogation. With each turn of the crank, the victim's muscles would be torn and their joints dislocated, leaving them writhing in agony. The further the torturer went, the higher the chance of dislocation of muscles and ligaments and loud popping sounds. Oh, and if they still failed to extract the confession, there would be direct ripping of limbs from the body. Wait, it gets worse. Up next, we have the braking wheel, also known as the Catherine wheel. Secured to the spokes of the wheel, the victim would be revolved while torturers struck them with iron hammers, mangling their limbs and breaking their bones. After the brutal ordeal, victims were often left exposed to the elements, where they would succumb to their injuries or become prey to scavenging birds. Then we have the iron chair, which sounds like something right out of Game of Thrones. This was a chair adorned with menacing spikes on the seat, back, and armrests, was another favorite instrument of torture. When the victim was forced to sit upon the chair, the spikes would pierce their flesh, causing excruciating pain and profuse bleeding. Blood loss further intensified the victim's suffering, adding to the cruelty of this ghastly contraption. And let's not forget the psychological torture inflicted upon prisoners as they languished in dank, lightless dungeons surrounded by the stench of decay and the sound of their own tortured screams echoing off the stone walls. Interrogators employed tactics of fear and intimidation, using threats of further torture or promises of leniency to extract confessions from their hapless victims. Public Spectacles and Punitive Parades In the heart of bustling medieval towns, public spectacles of punishment were not just events, they were occasions that drew crowds from far and wide, eager to witness the raw, unfiltered drama of justice served in the most visceral of ways. Picture this, the town square bustling with activity, as townsfolk gather, anticipation hanging thick in the air like a shroud, awaiting the unfolding spectacle of humiliating parades and public displays of punishment. Starting off with the most absurd one, the pillory. The pillory was a form of public shaming and humiliation in which the prisoner would place their neck and wrists through holes in a hinged wooden board, therefore trapping them in place for everyone to see. Here, offenders would be locked into place, exposed to the jeers and taunts of the crowd, their shame laid bare for all to see. It was a punishment as much psychological as it was physical. Passersby would then mock, humiliate, and make fun of them. This would even escalate to spitting on them or throwing rotten vegetables and even animal excrement. There was also the danger that the criminal could be killed when the crowd became too violent whilst throwing stones or bricks, because that is something that would happen as well. Public floggings were a common sight, where wrongdoers were stripped bare and lashed with whips or rods in full view of the community. The crack of the whip echoed through the square as the accused endured the painful lashes, their cries of agony serving as a chilling reminder of the consequences of transgression. It was a brutal form of humiliation, intended to shame the perpetrator while simultaneously asserting the authority of the ruling powers. 
But public humiliation didn't stop at floggings. Oh no, medieval justice had a flair for the dramatic, and the executions were a prime example. And then there were the executions, gruesome affairs that drew crowds by the thousands, eager to witness the ultimate spectacle of justice served. From beheadings and hangings to gruesome displays of disembowelment and dismemberment, medieval executions were as varied as they were brutal. The town square would transform into a theater of horrors as condemned criminals met their fate in a macabre dance of death. Then burning at the stake was another horrific form of execution for blasphemous thieves and so-called witches. The most saddening thing is that most of these women were always innocent healers or doctors, and if they would do anything out of the norm, they would be labeled as witches. Their pleas were never really heard, too, because it just took for one random man to point a finger and accuse a woman, and there and then the decision would be made, and you would see them burnt at the stake. Usually the condemned would die from suffocation before the flames started to burn their flesh. The suffering of the condemned could be prolonged by the executioner by making the fire small, causing loss of blood and heat stroke. But perhaps most chilling of all were the punitive parades, where offenders would be paraded through the streets in chains, their crimes announced for all to hear. It was a public shaming of the highest order, a stark reminder of the consequences of straying from the path of righteousness. And as the procession wound its way through the town, the message was clear. Defy the law, and you too could find yourself at the mercy of medieval justice. Are you still reeling from the shock of medieval justice? From the horrific torture devices like the rack and the breaking wheel to the public floggings and burning at stake. But hold on to your hats because there's much more to uncover from the secrets of history. So dive deeper with our captivating videos by liking and subscribing. And don't forget to comment about what other videos you'd like to see next.